We all know that building relationships with students is key. What if there was a framework we could follow, a plan, so to speak, that helped us do just that? Well, guess what? There is. The book is called Building Bonds with Learners, the Teacher-Student Relationship Model. And it's by Patricia Irby. And this book gives us that plan. This book goes through a model that if we follow, we can build strong relationships with students that lead to their social, emotional, and academic success. What is it, you ask? Branding. Finding out what makes you unique and allowing students to see you shine. Bonding. Creating that safe space where students are respected, valued, and feel a connection. And building. That's right. That's that intentional planning of how you're going to brand yourself and bond with students. And then, of course, Reflecting wraps it all up because we all know how reflecting is important to continually improve in our daily practices. This is a great conversation I have with Patricia around a fantastic model, the teacher-student relationship model. I thank you for taking the time to listen and encourage you to hit subscribe wherever you listen. And even more importantly, rate and review the show so that more people can get access to it just like you. I would be very grateful. Now, enough from me. Let's hear from Patricia Irby, author of Building Bonds with Learners, the Teacher-Student Relationship Model on Seeing to Lead. Creating strong bonds with the students leads to so many wonderful things that we're looking for our students. A greater sense of belonging, for example, we're huge. We want every student to want to come to school and be a part of a larger group learning. Dr. Chris Jones here and welcome to Seeing to Lead, a show designed to help leaders increase their ability to effectively support, engage, and empower their staff through intentional practices so that they create an environment where everyone reaches their greatest level of success. On Seeing to Lead, communication rules the day as we hear voices from both teachers and leaders in an effort to examine perspectives, highlight misunderstandings, and provide steps to ultimately bridge the gap between what teachers need and provide through thought dialogue. This show is about amplifying voices, creating understanding, and providing information to help everyone continually improve. I want to personally thank you for taking the time. Now, let's get to getting better. Patricia Irby is an author and former educator in Pennsylvania's Westchester Area School District, where she taught for decades at the elementary and secondary levels while also serving as a team leader, curriculum developer, science advocate, early field and student teacher mentor and consultant to individuals and organizations for professional growth and practical teaching applications. In addition to these leadership experiences, she has bolstered her social emotional focus by leading extracurricular activities and clubs for young learners and as a consistent informal mentor for colleagues. During her career, Ms. Erbe was awarded best teacher of the year and has continued to work toward elevating student potential through relationship building and keeping up with current research and educational offerings. In addition to benefiting from numerous professional development opportunities, she has assisted other educational leaders in presenting professional development seminars. Patricia received her bachelor's degree in elementary education from Millersville University and a master's from Wilkes University, emphasizing educational development and strategies. In addition, she acquired a secondary teaching certificate and has completed extensive coursework in social-emotional learning. Patricia is, yes, an author, but her book was recently released, Building Bonds with Learners, the Teacher-Student Relationship Model. This is where a lot of our conversation is going to live today. I really liked this book because it focuses on practical strategies for building and maintaining relationships with students. So Patricia, welcome to Seeing the Lead. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm very happy to be here. This is going to be a really good conversation because it centers on the idea of relationships. And we talk a lot about relationships in schools and how you have to start with relationships if you're going to teach students what they need to know. Because your book is a lot about that, could you take some time and just let the listeners know what led you to the book? What led you to writing this book? Oh, boy. About five years ago or so, 
I was reaching a milestone of 25 years of teaching and thinking, what is my teaching legacy? And then COVID came and there was a lot of time to think even more about it. And I reflected upon my conversations with my colleagues and them, a few of them saying, what are you going to do one day when you're not here and I use you as a mentor? And in all humbleness, I said, I, I, I don't know, but you can certainly reach out to me. And that made me start to think about not just me, but many other educators who are looking toward those senior years of teaching and beginning to leave and retire and so forth. And, and I thought I really wanted to leave something behind, something structured that teachers come, new coming into teaching and even teachers who are wanting to improve their relationships with students would be able to use. So I started looking online for a one-stop I always knew I had a book in my head. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, I knew that I wanted to write something. I didn't even know what. <laughs> so this kind, this thought process led me to writing the book eventually. And I was looking for, in my research, a one-stop resource for teachers where they could gain insight into better connections with uh, young learners. And I didn't see a one-stop shop there. I just saw bits and pieces, chapters here, maybe a focus on a particular student, type of student that, you know, you could connect with and how to do that. And so then I looked at some other research and saw what, something very powerful. I mean, we all think all educators know that when we make positive connections with students, we definitely are assisting them in their journey. You know, it's a wonderful thing. But I think in seeing this research on, believe it or not, a hormone called oxytocin, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's released by the brain when individual or relationships are built among people, either two people or groups, and it actually uh, regulates the emotions and social competencies. And I was like, wow, this is more important than I realized. Maybe we need to look at this more concretely. And so through the research, I started writing the book in my head. I had it mapped out exactly the way I thought it could go. And that led to um, the teacher relations, teacher student relationship model. That's fantastic. And, you know, it's one of the things we had talked about before I, I hit record is how I love the book and how it's structured around the teacher-student relationship model. Before we get to that, because it's broken up by that and it kind of follows that model with each piece of it, which I think is going to be really helpful for the listeners. I know at least it was really helpful for me, made me do a lot of reflecting as I read through it. But I had asked you again before the show what your superpower was, and I just find it really fascinating how it ties into why you wrote the book. The idea that you're great at connecting people, but more importantly, connecting people with what they need. And so I love how that manifested itself in the book. Was that something you realized was happening or was that something you said, hey, I'm really good at this. People need this. I see a need. Let me provide the need. I think I felt I had a gift of that in make you know, the connection gift, I call it. And then I saw the need and I just went with it. Like you said, this, yeah, yeah, but that, <laughs> what you just said, I, you know, it's, I realized that, and I say this in the book, you cannot pave a road while you're driving on it, and neither can you drive on it without directions. You have to have a map. And I, in making connections all my life, I knew that I had to put two and two together, so to speak. So, that played into my putting this idea together and coming up with the model. So let's talk about that map or that model for a minute. You know, when, when you're talking about it, there's multiple parts to it. So do you mind giving us an overview of the different sections of it? And then we can go back and we can talk about each section so people get a better understanding of what that looks like. Sure. 
Basically, the model is set up in four elements or part. The first part being the branding part, which I know sounds very corporate, but I'll explain that in a little bit, not to uh, put any fear out there. Bonding, which is, you know, the bonding of the relationship, uh, all the aspects that go into it. And I found in my research and my own experience when I put the two together, that the bonding piece is the bulk of the book. And it is where I took different, what I call considerations that are imperative to have and to know and to understand in order to build a relationship. It's not just, oh, um, beginning of the year, let me set a professional goal that I'm going to develop relationships with my students, real positive ones. There really needs to be uh, a plan, which leads us to the building where you're organizing a, a consistent plan and to meet the relationship goals that you've set forth. And then finally, which is good practice for every educator, and we do it sometimes without even thinking, is the reflecting piece. The reflecting is the fourth part or principle of the model itself. And all of these are what help to facilitate social, emotional, and academic success. It's, you know, and when you walk around it, I even like how... And as you walk around, and I noticed it in the book, but when you just said that, how they all build on each other. So you can't really, you can't really do bonding as effectively as possible without the branding. And you can't do the building without the bonding, et cetera. So I really like that. And, you know, you'd mentioned branding and right. When we talk about branding, we think about sales, we think about marketing, you know, Nike, all that. But what type of branding are you talking about and why is that valuable to teachers? Well, it goes along with working through understanding who you are as a teacher and as a person. Those are two important pieces of branding. I walk teachers through who are reading this to find out what their passions are, how authentic they are, what kind of positive first impressions do they show to their student? And one of the stories that I can give you an idea just to, to, for better understanding, I talk with an educator who, and it's in the book, I do talk about that. You probably read it about the teacher who had the bobblehead uh, dolls yeah, of all yeah, different yeah. sports characters. And she would wrap them up every year so carefully and bring them out. In the, you know, September or August and put them up on our shelves. And that was, you know, students would walk into the room and see that immediately. Oh, this teacher likes sports. This teacher is, you know, I like sports, that kind of thing. And then she integrated a sports coaching kind of mentality in the classroom that was phenomenal. And the kids really bought into that and it helped develop the relationships through that. That was part of her brand. It was what made her unique as opposed to the person next door, the the educator next door. And so this branding part of the model helps educators, what I put in there, helps educators to be able to determine what makes them different from someone else and how much of that uh, personal part of me, so to speak, would, am I willing to share with my students? Because I think if we take out too much of our personality or pers- what we what we do besides school and teach, they don't get to know our who we are. And you have to be comfortable with what you're sharing with students. I, I realize that. But it does encourage one to look at what you can share, what you feel you're comfortable with sharing to help build bonds with them. So now how does that, because right, that leads into the bonding piece. And I like how you put that. It's, it's about the, the branding piece is, a piece is not about marketing, but more about authenticity and the teacher being who they are and coming to grips through reflection with how much of that person they're willing to share because it, it is at their core of them and who they are. Is that right? Am I repeating that back to you, right? You are. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 
And I think about that balance between personal and professional. It's funny, as I'm sitting here drawing some notes down, I, I drew a seesaw and I put personal on one side and professional on the other and, and where you fall on that. So when I'm thinking about this, does it matter for the bonding piece on a continuum almost? So the more you personally share, does that mean the higher the chance that you'll build strong bonds with the students? Or does it even matter as much as you personally share? It just happens to be that extra added thing. Because I'm thinking, just knee jerk, that the less personal you decide to share, the less you'll bond with the students. But that might not hold true. I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I think every situation is unique with each student. So that might, for some students, sharing more of your personal passions and so forth might bode well for them in building a relationship with them. Where others, it may not matter. There are some students who are very focused, don't need quite as much of that background maybe of you. But I think I feel that it you want to be able to allow yourself to be known, if that makes sense. Whether that's a few things that you're well known for, or maybe uh, a multiple things that little things that you're known for. It, it's just, I think it helps in most of the cases to be able to put that forward, you know, more of yourself forward. That's my opinion. As far as research is concerned, it's research really, I have to talk about research. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Research definitely emphasizes communication. So it is kind of a natural process as you're communicating to share more of yourself and who you are as a person. Does it almost, you know, I can't help but think, does it, is it almost because it offers more predictability to the students? When you said, allow yourself to be known, that resonated with me in a way that says students can now predict what you're going to be like. So if that part of you, so say you run your class like uh, a team, like that example, to go back to that example you were using, and you're interested in sports, does that offer students the predictability of maybe I'm going to be more like coached when I make a mistake or get something wrong? So maybe it's not the be all end all. And I can see a teacher that acts more like a coach leaning more towards retakes, multiple retakes, for example, with grades and so forth. Whereas if you're a teacher that is known to, you know, you let yourself be known, time and scheduling and things like that are very important to you. So maybe the student knows, okay, I definitely can't be late turning something in in this class where the other class I might be able to push the boundary a little bit. Is that why it helps the predictability piece? I think that's a, you've hit it on the head there with predictability. I think it allow it helps the student not to have to guess, which then leads to being, feeling comfortable in the space. Right, right. Feeling safe in the space. And that all leads to better relationship. Everything, the relationship building is the foundation for all learning. It drives learning. It drives a student agency, a dietary right. you know, just all those things that we would want to see in our classroom. So, yeah, I think you're right. You did hit that on the head. Good. Supporting your teachers and students seems to be a struggle. They just don't seem to be engaged. You wish they would take more responsibility for their learning and culture of the building, but they just don't seem to be empowered enough to do it. So, my question is, have you checked out the book Seeing to Lead yet? It's all about creating a true educational experience where learning, growth, leadership, and community take center stage. Full of strategies and resources, Seeing to Lead is about attaining that goal by employing a model that supports, engages, and empowers all individuals to become leaders themselves. Pick up a copy today at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G. T-O-L-E-A-D dot com. Remember, you don't become a leader and then decide you need to support and recognize others more than yourself. 
it is the moment you realize it's about supporting and recognizing others that you become a leader. SeeingToLead.com. So talk to me about that building piece. That seems, right, so from the idea that relationships matter and being all in it, in on something like that, I can see a person saying, well, of course, yeah, we got to do this. Let's put these p- systems in place to help us build these things. And then I can see the cynical piece also of, well, I don't have time to do all of that and set systems or programs in place to build relationships with students because you offer a couple of tools and tracking things along with the book that that help with that. So what does that look like? We Right. We've decided our brand. We've decided how much we're going to share. We're building bonds with students, but we want to make sure that it's a continuous, consistent effort, an intentional building of bonds with students. What do systems look like that help that? What does the organization around that look like? How do teachers do that better in schools and how do leaders help teachers do that better in schools? Very good questions there. If we just back up a moment to the bonding part of this. A lot of that are things that we already do, you know, that we do well, that are built, you know, you know, the classroom learning environment, what it speaks of us, the communication. These are all really good guidelines, basically, throughout the bonding part of the book on what to do, what not to do, you know, with best practices, basically. And we can't assume that everyone knows that in education. So it's, it's there. So the building piece, which is a step-by-step guide, is very simple in that there there are different strategies and suggestions that I put in there to help you actually like questions to, you know, question questioning students to get to know them, how to set that up, actually some printouts, you know, that can be used for data collection. And I know that sounds, you hear that word data. I know sometimes when I hear that word data, I want to run out of the room. But in doing this, which is very simplistic and making oneself more accountable, am I reaching that student? Have I reached that student this week? Have I said anything? Have I fist bumped them? Have I done anything like to connect with them at all? Putting effort there is going to make things easier in other areas, such as having to deal with behavioral issues or, you know, students who are sliding and you didn't catch it. You know, you you have all this in place. You know them better and they're more apt to communicate with you when there are things that they need. And so that in turn just creates those meaningful connections that, when you learn more about your city. So I don't know if I answered all of those questions. If I didn't, I'll be happy to, you know, elaborate on. Well, no, I've I've got some follow-up. You did answer those. And I, you know, sometimes I do that. I, I get too excited about something and I ask like 50,000 questions and then have you talk. But it's fine. <laughs> I was going to say, so just tell me if I have to rein it in. But, um, you know, when you talk about, I think in my personal life, so to speak, I have so many different things going on that anything I can automate, I do. And I've had quite a few conversations lately, and this is going to seem like it's going to come out of left field. So just bear with me for a second. But recently had a lot of conversations around AI and the integration of AI and the usefulness of AI and the things that are, you know, not so useful about AI and how we grapple with that moving forward as a school with our students. And one of the conversations I had recently It talks about how AI can help free up teachers' time so that they can actually focus on more relationship SEL-based things. Do you see, personally, AI is playing a role when we say data, when we say tracking, when we say reminding, or to help teachers improve their ability to build relationships with students? Or is that really just too far afield and not a place for that? I really haven't thought about that. Yeah. It's an excellent question because we're on the cusp of all this just growing, you know, AI just becoming so huge. I don't know. I have to say, I really don't know. 
uh, an answer to that. I think we have to be careful in that we don't take away the humanness, if that's the correct word. You're an author. You get to make up your own words. Don't worry about it. Aspect. There you go. There you go. Relationship building. We really have to be careful with that. And this may sound a little, well, it's not, you know, it can be tech-based, of course, any kind of logging of information with the plan that you create. In the building phase, There, you know, I do talk about you have to actually build a plan. If you don't build a plan to build relationships, it could just be, you know, in the air. And so... The plan can be technology-based, definitely, and you can log information that way, but I'm not sure using AI, again, will take away from the, you know, human aspect again. I I don't know. Yeah, I was just wondering with the, you know, with the exponential growth of it as it's occurring, and, and now that it's been here for a little while, people becoming more accepting of it instead of just, you know, that's something new and kind of backing up, but... Just curious, just reflecting on that, which, oddly enough, how's that for a segue? Goes yeah, goes right next to, especially when I call it out on, on air while we're recording, but that goes right into the last section of that framework, which is the reflecting piece. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Many people say, reflecting, reflect on this. Any tips, tricks, strategies, what works best? I uh, have always been one to look back at lessons or a year in the making, you know, a year that has transpired and what worked, what didn't work. That very simple. And I think that has helped me as an educator to move forward in a better direction. So this reflecting piece of the model is basically what we Like I said, we all do either in our heads or we write it down and we revisit and reflect their very powerful habits for us and so critical to improve, especially with the model, because you're, you know, the building process in what you've hopefully logged or written about your students or whatever is to go back and say, what could I have done differently with that student that maybe stuck out that I tried and I, I, I did develop a relationship, but hey, it, I felt like I wanted it to be stronger. I wanted it to be more positive. And that's going to help in future interactions with other students down the road, of course. And so the reflecting piece doesn't have to be difficult. It can be very simple, just simple notes about, you know, a few things that you want to take away from your experiences with building students for a particular year, but semester, whatever it happens to be. And so branding, bonding, building, and reflecting. That's the teacher-student relationship model, how it all learns to social, emotional, and academic success. Yeah, I just... That framework, I found this, and that's, you know, that's the title of the book that we're talking about, Building Bonds with Learners, the teacher-student relationship model that has just recently been published by you. I just found when I read this book, I have to encourage listeners to pick up a copy of this book because it's written on that framework. And I found that that was very helpful as I went through it to know that it was on that framework. And then I had each section and I could actually draw connections between each based on how it built on itself. Did you use any of the reflecting prompts throughout the book? There were a few in there Mm -hmm. that you could stop and write in. I don't know if the listeners would be interested in that, but there are areas throughout that lend themselves to, you know, collaborating with others. White space, I find, is always helpful. That stop and reflect piece in books is always helpful. But I personally, I'm a margin note taker. So I have notes written in the margins that I go back to. I dog your pages, I this, that, the other thing. But I'm an underliner and a margin note taker. So I typically, it's funny, I save those spaces for later when I go back and look at what I did the chapter before or the section before that's meant to reflect on. 
And that's where I put that new thought I have or that I come up with or that really resonates with me based on what I wrote margin notes about, what I underlined, what I starred and things like that. That's, I'm an underliner also. Highlighter, different colors. <laughs> really? See, I, I never got into the highlighting thing. I was a highlight failure early on in my college career. I went back and looked at one of my books I had as a freshman in college and like every sentence was highlighted. It was like I was highlighting as I was reading. So I never really got the gist of highlighting, but kudos to you, especially with the multiple color highlighters. Yeah. So now that we've gone through that, we've gone through the section of the book, we're near the end of the podcast. And I asked two questions of every person that comes on. Who, not what would you be if you weren't an educator? Would be someone who missed out on one of the greatest professions ever. And I know that sounds very corny in a way, but it's true. It has given me as much or more than as I have given it as a profession. And it's fed me, allowed me to flourish, helping others, which if we go back to what we were talking about with me realizing that connections were a superpower, so to speak, actually allowed me to do that every single day. And so I would be a probably a miserable person if I didn't. <laughs> I don't know if that's you were asking who I would be. I, I probably would fi- have to find something else that would be in that would feed that desire to help others and connect for various reasons. And that's in the community somewhere, probably. So that is so well put in the reasoning behind it and how much this profession has meant to you. So thank you for sharing that. You're very welcome. I hope that others can find that as well. Mm. You know. Well, with people like you out there helping them, I don't see how they can't. So Okay. What you know, you've said a lot about your your model and your and the book. But what's the most important piece of advice you would give to leaders as they work to better support, engage, and empower those they serve? I guess I should, those who lead educators, our administrators, supervisors, directors, the advice I have is really to look at the importance of relationship building as primary before other professional development opportunities or whatever or alongside them, at least have that as a focus in the school and really work on it. Not once and done, hit and miss, but consistent. And the other point is to just trust that the teachers are making decisions for their students that are, you know, what they're supposed to be doing and to be visible and supportive of the teachers. For teachers, I feel that, again, the relationship building should take a priority. Take some time in the beginning of the year and throughout at different points, maybe once a week, maybe every day, a few minutes, whatever. But make that a priority, that building as a whole even. And, you know, of course, individually, as much as they are able, all else will follow there. Create strong bonds with the students. Creating strong bonds with the students leads to so many wonderful things that we're looking for our students. A greater sense of belonging, for example, we're huge. We want every student to want to come to school and be a part of a larger group learning. You know, it leads to active engagement, at least to fewer disciplinary issues, and ultimately the academic success. I talked in the book a little bit about COO. I don't know if you remember reading that. It was a chief opportunity, excuse me, chief opportunity officer. And that would be, instead of being a guide on the side, you're a COO. So you try to find those dare, help your students find those dare to be great moments, you know, to to just soar. And so that's kind of the advice I have for them. I don't, I mean, for today. There, there you go. I think, that's, I think that's great advice. And I think that's a good spot right there to ask, what's the best way people can 
get in touch with you if they want to reach out to hear more? I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to reach me. And I would email sometimes. My my inbox is so full, I would be afraid I might miss somebody. See but LinkedIn, it's still pretty clean. So I shouldn't miss anything. Sounds good. And um, and we'll also set up a link for your book in the show notes. So um, we'll be good there. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been a great experience. I really appreciate your time and talking to me about my book. Well, that's a wrap, but not the end. Next step, be sure to take action on something you heard here today. Hey, thanks for listening to the Seeing to Lead podcast. If you would like to connect for any reason, email me at drchrissj at gmail.com or catch me on Twitter at Dr. C.S. Jones. If you've gotten any value from the Seeing to Lead podcast today, you can help me and other leaders create a world-class environment through a teacher-centric approach by subscribing to the show, leaving an honest rating and review, and sharing this episode on social media with your most valuable takeaway. Also, one last thing. Have you had a chance to pick up my latest five-star rated book yet? Grab your copy of Seeing to Lead anywhere you buy books or at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com where you can learn more and continue to improve. Now go have a successful week.